Greetings! This is Artie from Artifact Electronics. Today we're going to have some fun with an RGB LED strip. Now I know there's probably a gazillion of videos on this on YouTube and how-to's and all of that good stuff, but uh, here's my take on it. And uh, first we're going to have a look at how this thing works and uh, then see what we can do with it, how we can have some fun with it. So, the reason I got this, uh, my wife dragged me to an IKEA store the other day, and uh, I always get confused in there because of the layout, where they basically force you to look at everything they have with this maze-like pathway. But I still got bored because there was a lot of stuff I, I really had no interest in, and I couldn't find my wife, but then I stumbled upon these LED strips. And these, these have become very prominent. You can get them. You can get them a lot cheaper than you can get them at Ikea. But, uh, you know, I, I don't know about you, but I, I kind of like buying things in stores. You know, e-commerce is fine. It's cheap. It's uh, fantastic. But uh, I miss the good old days when the weekend came and you took your paycheck and you went and paid, uh, spent it at a store and actually got something and came home with it. So, I guess it wasn't that bad after all. I stumbled upon this, and it looked it looked intriguing. Again, not the cheapest. I think this thing cost me like uh, $30. It's a uh, Ledberg. And uh, you, get, uh, you get a power supply. A 24-volt uh, DC power supply that plugs into a controller and that lights up the LEDs and I've already kind of cracked open the controller because that's my main point of interest yeah that you kind of stick a screwdriver and this thing pops open but uh, to me uh, buying I mean you get a manual with it but the manual is kind of like Lego manuals they use these icons that are supposed to be understood worldwide and uh, I think with the result that nobody understands what they mean. But this thing is really not that hard to figure out. The main thing is getting a controller with it. Because this thing to me is like the technical manual for it. This will reveal exactly how this thing works. And while there's no brain surgery involved in uh, driving an LED or three of them or a string of them. It's still interesting to have this thing to see how in this specific application they control this and uh, make it sing. Alright, let's plug this thing in and uh, see what it does. And one thing I noticed is this, it comes up in a random mode when you plug it in. So we'll talk about why that is later on, but it has, let's see, four modes. So basically in this mode, uh, okay, this is obviously the off mode. You hit the little button. And what it'll do is it'll cycle through, well, they're not primary colors because you get, let's see, it's going to do yellow, cyan, and a bunch of other colors. And then what you do is once it shows the color you want, you press the button again and it stops on that color. It kind of looks white on the video, but this is actually yellow. And then you press the button again, and it'll start to do RGB magic by mixing the uh, colors and uh, giving you this result. And then when you press the button again, it turns off. And that's it. That's all it does. So you're supposed to, you get 5 meters of, LED, of RGB LEDs spaced approximately, what, an inch and a half, two inches apart. And... Uh, I, I don't know what you're supposed to do with this. I guess you hang it up around your workbench, and uh, if it's near the holidays, then it gives you a holiday spirit, or if it's in the summer, you think you're at a car dealership. I'm not exactly sure. I mean, LEDs are neat, but I couldn't exactly figure out what good these are. So what it boils down to is what can we do with it? What can we do with it so it becomes something more 
more useful. And in order to do that, the first thing we got to do is uh, figure out how this thing works. So here's the board. Can't see that very well, can you? A little better. So I poked around with a meter and it spilled its beans very quickly. There's nothing complicated on here. It's pretty straightforward, except that anything above a resistor on here is housemarked. You can pretty much guess what they are, but uh, they were nice to, first of all, housemark everything, and second of all, to print them in such faint ink that it's uh, you need an electron microscope to read the markings. But again, uh, shouldn't be too big of a deal. I'll show you what I found. So, uh, we know that it's got a 24-volt uh, DC supply, and uh, it also has a small MCU on it, that uh, makes the patterns you saw happen. So, uh, starting, the MCU, of course, uh, doesn't run off 24 volts. I think it's like something like an ST8. It's an 8-pin. So, the first thing that they need to do is take the 24 volts that's coming in and uh, create the, uh, well, either 3.3 or 5. In this case, it's actually running off of 5 volts. So, uh, the way that looks is, if this is our regulator, and uh, the way this works is, if I look at my notes, we got ground, we get the input, so this is ground, this is the input, and this is the output. And the input has a resistor, a diode, and is connected to 24 volts. And the third leg, the output, is plus 5 volts DC. One thing you may notice right off the bat is that uh, this regular essentially has got to eat 19 volts if it wasn't for the extra stuff in here. And uh, that's uh, it's a teeny tiny regulator. It is... Uh, where is it? Oh, I'm, I'm fighting the uh, glare again. Or the focus. This is it. Small guy. Doesn't have a heat sink on it. And, I mean, if that guy's got to drop 19 volts, it's going to get really, really, really hot. So what they do is, there's a diode that drops, like, what, 0.6 volts. It doesn't do much, but I think that is in there for reverse current protection. Or reverse voltage protection, I should say. And then it's got a 500 ohm resistor here. And we could figure out, you know, based on the current, they probably drop a significant portion of the 24 volts across this resistor so that this thing doesn't get too hot. If the potential that it's got to drop is too high, even at low current, this thing's going to heat up really horribly. And, uh, but there you go. This is basically the power supply for the MCU. The LEDs actually live off the 24 volts. And, uh, so that's voltage reg that's the voltage regulation part. Next we have the MCU which is uh, right here, 8 pins surface mount. And uh, as I said, it's something like an ST8, really simplistic little processor with not too much external stuff required. So it gets its ground on this pin gets 5 volts coming out of the regulator we just looked at on this pin then this pin doesn't look like it's connected to anything that might be a programming pin this pin goes to that push button switch we saw on the board to ground and that's the button you push for it to change modes I mean the push button is probably the largest 
the heftiest component on the board. It's right here. Then uh, we have this pin, and this is either a mode pin or a reset pin, even though there's no, there doesn't seem to be a capacitor here, but uh, it has a resistor on it and uh, goes to plus 5 volts. And then we have leftover three pins, and essentially, after measuring them out, we have the R, the red driver, the blue driver, and the green driver. And since it's a 5 volt part, this just outputs uh, 5 volts. And what it's doing is it's outputting PWM. So, uh, based on the duty cycle, I mean, the PWM is essentially used as a cheapo uh, D to A converter. And based on the duty cycle, that particular LED becomes brighter the uh, larger the duty cycle is. And that's it for the processor. Finally, we have some driving circuitry for each of the LEDs. So what I'm showing you now is one of three. So this comes from, let's say, it comes from either the R, G, or B pin. It goes through a uh, limiting resistor. Because you use a transistor without a limiting resistor and you will blow it out immediately. It's got a pull down and I think the pull down is there to basically make sure that if this thing's going bananas or is floating that uh, the transistor is kept off, which we will get to really soon. And uh, then this feeds an NPN. And I'm not going to get into the gory details of it all, but uh, this is essentially the switch that turns things on and off. So when uh, the voltage sits at zero, this thing is, uh, is open. And what's coming out of here is, let's see, it's not complete complete what I'm drawing here. I may have left out a few nickel and dime parts, but uh, that doesn't really matter that much. So we have a resistor to drop the voltage. Uh, depending on, uh, you know, there are different value resistors because they're driving the red, blue, and green. Notice that I don't say RGB, but RBG, because that's the order they use, and that had me confused in the beginning. But essentially, then you have a, an LED over here. And the other end of it is connected to 24 volts. So under normal circumstances, it's always fed by 24 volts, but if this thing's open, nothing much happening, the LED doesn't light up. Now, if the incoming control signal goes high, it turns on the transistor, which essentially completes the path to ground over here, and the LED lights up. Now remember, we are getting a PWM coming in here. So essentially, the net effect of it is, is if you have a 50% PWM coming in, this thing's going to be on half the time. So you're going to see this LED with a 50% PWM be at approximately 50% brightness. Keep in mind that LEDs are not totally linear in their intensity uh, as compared to the incoming voltage. So it's, it's not always that simple. But for these discussions, we can just assume that based that there's a direct correlation between the pulse width, uh, uh, the pulse width and the intensity of each LED. Now, how do we get different colors? We basically get different colors by color mixing them. So, for instance, if... Uh, now, we have three of these. If we only have R on and, and green and blue off, 
then we are only controlling the red intensity. But now we can start mixing things by turning on the different colors with different intensities and theoretically should be able to get a lot of colors depending on the resolution of the duty cycle that we can get. I don't know what the resolution of the duty cycle is on this system, but let's assume it's 128 or 64 or whatever. In that case, uh, we get uh, 64 cube different uh, colors we will get out of the light, out of the LED module. Now I say LED module and my uh, crappy camera won't show it, but the LEDs are actually contain three separate LEDs, red, blue, and green, but they're in such close proximity to each other that if you're not sticking your eye right into it, it will seem to you, you will only see the resulting color. So, in order to make this work then, uh, I mean, that's all the processor is doing. It's pre-programmed to send out certain sequences of RGB values, and that's what you're seeing on the LED strip. We can't, we can't really change it. Well, what we can do, we can change the sequence. And again, this is the selector mode. So, once we hit a color we like, we hit the button, and there you go. We basically got blue at probably half intensity or something here. And then in the next mode, where you can see it fade from color to color, and uh, again the camera doesn't show it really well, but yes, there are different uh, colors showing up, and it's just changing the uh, pulse width of the RGB signals. It's a programmed sequence in there, and that makes it do this. Then you hit the button again, and it goes off. So what we need is something that lets us control three PWM impulses uh, independently so that we can theoretically get any color we want or any sequence we want and uh, of course what we need for that is a function generator a function generator such as that which will allow you which will output a square wave at five volts and allow you to change the uh, the duty cycle. Then we're going to need three of those, and I just happen to have three of those. But that's that's kind of geeky to use a, the function generator to do this. So let's see if we can find something that is more fun than using a lab instrument to control the color of this strip. But first we need to alter this module a little bit so we can inject our own signals into it. And I think the easiest way, again, this is the uh, 24 volts coming in. This is the common anode voltage of 24 volts. And these are RBG control lines that carry the, uh, the uh, PWM signal. And these are the driver transistors for, for the LEDs. And yeah, that's about it. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to remove the MCU and connect directly to the uh, limiting resistor that goes into the base of each of the transistors so that we can inject 5 volt signals, 5 volt PWM signals into those and uh, see, see how well we can control this. So here are the results of my uh, preparation. I just took this guy off and soldered wires to the output that drive the red, blue, and green. And then I promptly noticed that blue is correct, but the green and the red wire are inverted. But I did such a good job, I'm not going to touch it. Just keep in mind, red is green and green is red. And, of course, blue is blue. So let's see what we can drive this with. So here's the modified board again. Remember, red is green and green is red. And uh, what we're going to use as a function generator, which is complete overkill, but lots of fun, is a modular synthesizer. And we're basically going to use modulating signals 
Well, we're going to generate pulse wave, pulse with modulation signals, and see what that does to our strip. I got the uh, signal on the scope. Currently there's nothing coming out of it. And all I've done is I've hooked a voltage controlled oscillator, the output, the pulse output of it, up to both the scope and to the LED strip. But I've only hooked it up to the red LEDs right now to demonstrate what's going on. And uh, right now, nothing's coming out because the pulse width is essentially, or the duty cycle is set to zero. So now watch as we turn the uh, pulse width or the duty cycle up. And there you go. We got a narrow pulse. And as the pulse, as the duty cycle gets longer, the strip lights up brighter. So now, let's do the same thing with the other colors. So here's blue. And when we look at blue, same thing happens again. You'll also notice that the response is not very linear. I mean, you're getting the most changes with a low duty cycle and then things just kind of blur. The camera, of course, doesn't help, but this is about a 50%. So the strip right now is at half intensity. And for completeness, Let's go and look. Well, let me turn that down first. So we have nothing coming out. And if I turn the right button, it helps. And so what did we do? We did green last time. So, no, we didn't. We did red. I'm confusing myself now with the swap wire colors. So now we're hooked up to the red wire, which of course means we now are controlling the green LED. And there you have it. So yeah, that's you can manually set these things up and that of course doesn't do you a lot of good. So let's start automating things a little bit. One thing that we can do is change well, not automate, but basically modulate the uh, pulse width. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to take the output from the uh, mod wheel, which essentially outputs a frequency, and use that to modulate the VCO. So what did I do? Okay, green is off. So now we go into the shape control voltage and it's just, it's on. It's permanently on because we have about 50% duty cycle. But now once I increase the mod input to it, so now we can see it animating we can change the intensity of the animation. Make it really slight or heavy. We can change the frequency of it. Now notice we're changing the frequency of the duty cycle. Changing the frequency of the oscillator itself is going to have very little, if any, effect. So I'm just going to adjust this so we can see it nicely on the scope, but notice it's the uh, duty cycle that's changing the intensity, but the overall frequency doesn't really do a whole lot. Now we can also use the actual control voltage that is used to change pitch from the keyboard 
uh, to build ourselves an on-off switch. Very exciting. I hit a low note and it comes on full intensity. I hit a high note and it goes off. Now if we add a little bit of a glide parameter to the whole thing, which means that when you're changing keys, the voltage doesn't jump instantaneously, but rather slowly. So if I hit a low note, you can see that it's dimming and brightening noticeably. Now I can make it really slow, turn the glide to slow, and you can see it dim and light up slowly. So that's another way to control this. So now let's combine another color in here and drive the two colors with separate modulations. Looking up here, looking at the scope for a sec, we can see it automatically creating this. So I guess what you could do is turn off the glide and then uh, as you're playing things on the keyboard have the uh, intensity of a certain color affected. So fast forward 24 hours I get into a really weird situation last night. Essentially I got out of sync with the uh, recording indicator on the camera. I was completely out of sync, so essentially when I thought I was filming, I wasn't. And when I thought I was not filming, I was. So uh, the footage that was supposed to come here consists of me walking back and forth and fetching cables and good shot of my shoes walking back and forth in the basement. Needless to say, I got a bit discouraged and finally gave up. So here's a second try and uh, I promise to keep a close watch on the recording indicator in the viewfinder. So what we're going to do now is create three different sources of pulse width modulation, hook them up to each of the three colors and see what the result looks like. And we're going to start off with something very similar if not identical to what we did before, but uh, we're going to use a VCO and we're going to modulate the pulse width of it with an LFO. Now, what's the difference between a VCO and an LFO? A VCO is optimized to create audible sound and an LFO is uh, optimized to create modulation. Same thing, they're both voltage controlled but uh, one just runs, has a better resolution in the low registers or at low frequencies and uh, the other one has is optimized for audible frequencies. But anyway, we got, first of all, I give, uh, I use an arbitrary output to give, to give a common to ground this instrument to the LED strip. And you can basically use any output because, or input for that matter, because the grounds are all tied together. And uh, and that gives you that gives you a secure ground connection, and you basically only need a single signal to modulate each color. So this one, as expected, is modulating the uh, the width or the duty cycle and uh, I'm manually adjusting it now but we'll leave it on full blast like this and uh, now let's go ahead and hook up the red LED to this and of course if I saw what I was doing Oh, come on. And there you go. <clears throat> Just as predicted. 
It's turning the reds on and off. Next we are going to use a random source, a random number generator, to modulate the uh, pulse width on this VCO over here. And we'll take the output of that and hook it up to blue. So we can play around. So essentially the brightness you're seeing is a random is a random sequence. And I'm showing you all of this separately first and then later on we'll combine it all. But that's the uh, second modulation we're going to use. And the third modulation for the third modulation we are going to use a sequencer. So what the sequencer does you can see it, it shows you the steps it's playing and with the pots you actually adjust what value you want it to output. I'm using a third channel on this because it allows you to limit the uh, slew rate over here so you hopefully don't get too much of a jump so that it actually glides from color from intensity to intensity rather than uh, doing the same thing that the random number generator did and what that looks like and we're going to use green for that so now this isn't random of course but I can actually change things by uh, changing the knob settings on the uh, lowest row of this. We can change the uh, clock setting of it. But it's a repeating pattern. So now let's hook up all the other ones. So we're going to hook up our first one to the red and the random one to the blue and this is what we get and again unfortunately because of the camera you can't really I mean it looks very bright you can't really see the colors very well but we'll use the trick we used before and put something white in proximity of the LEDs and maybe that reflection will show the color better but it doesn't how about the uh, yeah see the side of the wood actually works better so don't look at the strip directly but rather look at the uh, other side the wooden side and uh, that'll actually show you it diffuses the colors enough for the camera to be able to pick them up now keep in mind, this barely scratches the surface of what can be done, of how you can visualize a PWM with an RGB LED. It depends in music, it depends on your playing style, on your music style, which signal you want to tap into to run the LEDs. And again, anything that creates PWM in this case, uh, in a 0 to 5 volt range, can be used to make the LEDs do stuff. Also in this case, it's running automatically. I'm not playing, but uh, using the uh, key that you press as a uh, pulse with uh, as a duty cycle value would actually make it much more interactive rather than just doing this thing on its own. Now let's turn the lights off and see what this looks like and there you go imagine yourself on stage the fans are screaming at you and uh, 
there's your light show. Looks pretty neat, doesn't it? But yes, this is uh, a very elaborate function generator setup. And uh, this is the definition of overkill for you. But I hope you learned something, and I even hope that you can use some of this, whether it's with your music, or with your Halloween stuff, or, or whatever, to have fun with an LED strip. Now, I need to re-emphasize this. A lot of people make a mistake and say, well, why don't you change the frequency uh, on the VCOs? Why do you keep modulating the pulse width? And that's because, if we go back to red, and from the theory it should be clear that the actual frequency doesn't doesn't affect the brightness, uh, the intensity, but only the uh, pulse width itself. So you can see the red. I can go here and uh, turn up the frequency. And you'll see that the frequency doesn't really affect things. Put it on a high frequency with the scope. But see, I'm going back and forth here, changing the frequency, and it is not changing the brightness. So we go back to low, And we see the direct correspondence between the pulse, well, the duty cycle, and the intensity of the light. Thanks for watching. Leave me a comment if you can come up with any uh, neat other applications uh, to, use, uh, to use an LED strip to visualize what it is you're doing electronically. I'm sure there are many, many different things you can do. And again, uh, if you want this to be more deterministic, uh, use a processor with three parallel output pins, and you can program exactly, as you saw at the beginning of the video, with the uh, processor that comes with it, it pretty much does the same thing. It either goes to, uh, you know, a limited set of colors, or it fades colors, but all in a predetermined path that somebody decided looked pleasing and made this into a consumer product. But with this simple hack I showed you, you can control it yourself and uh, do all kinds of crazy and wonderful things with it. Well, a thumbs up would be appreciated. And make sure to subscribe so you won't miss any of the other neat things that we'll be talking about. Enjoy yourselves, and we'll see you on the flip side.